Thanks, Simon. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, we'll start off, with the <coughs> start off with a prayer. Father, it's before your throne that we come this evening to thank you, Father, for this opportunity you've given us once again to gather in your name. We thank you, Father, for the time that we will share, for your word which you've opened before us. We pray for those who are with us this morning, for those who are joining us online, for those who couldn't be with us for other reasons, Lord, we pray that you bless them as well. Lord, we pray that whatever is said uh, in human weakness, that you bless it through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So, as you can hear, I have uh, a bit of a cold. Um, so bear with me uh, as we preach God's word. If I have a bit of a coughing fit, then uh, we'll just pause and continue. So this evening, <clears throat> this evening, I'd like to read from Genesis chapter six, and I've been inspired to go through this passage as we've been also following it, following Genesis with um, uh, Philip, who's actually been uh, helping us journey through the first few chapters and continues it, I think, when he's back from overseas. <coughs> so I'll start off with Genesis chapter 6, and we'll read the whole chapter. It's uh, 22 verses. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in the daughters of men, and they brought children to them, these were mighty men of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begat, begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourselves an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, it's width 50 cubits, it's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. And set the door of the ark on its side, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will cover, establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, flesh you shall bring it two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds of their kind, of, creep, of animals of their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. <coughs> Excuse me. And you shall take for yourself of all the food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. And thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So let's set the scene here. Um, you know, the first few chapters of Genesis, uh, chapters 1 to 5, very well known, um, are about creation, uh, the fall of man, and essentially about 
Um, as Philip has said, you know, um, um, the creation of, um, of Eve and the temptation of man to the Garden of Eden, where man's given the opportunity to um, take from the tree of life or the tree of good and evil, knowledge of good and evil, and then take from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then corruption enters humanity and the creation. Then you have the first murder where brother murders brother. Um, and then you have in verse, uh, in chapter 5, uh, in the end of chapter 4, you have the genealogy of Cain. And then in chapter 5, you have the family and the genealogy of Adam, which ends, <coughs> excuse me, which ends on verse 32, discussing um, and, and showing that Noah comes into the scene. And then we have chapter 6, which is what we've just read. So, a bit of, um, I was interested when I was preparing for this, what is the time between the creation of man, according to scripture, and the flood? There's been a lot of calculations, and it's accepted amongst Bible scholars that by calculating the genealogies um, between Adam and Noah, which is known as the Antiluvian period um, in history, uh, the free pre-flood period, we're talking of a period of uh, 1,656 years. So that's the period between Adam, creation of Adam, and uh, the flood. So in today's terms, it's always hard to, you know, appreciate numbers. So in today's terms, it's the time from 367 AD to today, 2023. Just a lot of time, a lot of time has passed for man to forget his creator, for man to fall in lawlessness and sin. And you get the flavour here that there was absolute lawlessness and sin across the face of the earth wherever man was. And it came to the point where it was corrupted so badly, it was corrupted so badly, that the Lord, that God was grieved in his heart. In verse 6, And the Lord was sorry <coughs> that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. What a statement to make when just a few chapters before, the Lord saw that all he had done, and it was good. In verse 5, we read, God saw that the wickedness of man was great, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. That means that every imagination, every purpose, every plan of man's heart was evil all of the time. It would have been every man or woman for themselves. There would have been uh, murders and abuses um, there would have been terrible things that were happening in mankind and on earth during that time to the point where God says the wickedness of man was great. And God was grieved in his heart. And I reflected on that, on that verse and I thought to myself, is God ever grieved in his heart for my life, for the things that I do, for my thoughts or our thoughts, our actions and motives? Do I look into my own heart as the Spirit convicts me and grieve for my own sin? And that's an important point, <clears throat> important point, because if we don't do that, we don't actually get the opportunity to bring ourselves before the Lord and ask for his conviction and his forgiveness over our sins. But then in verse 8, even though he is sorry, um, and it says in verse 7, I am sorry, the Lord says, that I have made them. He is now sorry for creating man. However, in verse 8, but Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord.
when I looked at um, other translations, the NASB reads, um, but Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. The Greek reads charin, and going back to the original Hebrew, the word used means both gracious and favoured, precious above all else. <coughs> so that's amazing. God, the eternal, the mighty, creator of all, looks down and considers a man, a man living in such a perverse and wicked time, precious, gracious, and favoured above all else. So precious, in fact, they would have put in place a plan that through him, mankind would survive the flood. And what makes him so special? What made him such a favoured man in the eyes of the creator of the Lord? And Noah loved the Lord. He was a righteous man. And in fact, if you look at his genealogy, his great-grandfather was the mighty Enoch, who did not die, but was taken to be with the Lord. His grandfather was Methuselah, who lived for, who was actually 969 years, and he was the longest recorded human to live. And his father Lamech also, Lamech also was a man that followed the Lord and walked with the Lord. Whereas Noah lived in verses 9 to 12, Noah lived in a world which was corrupt and filled with violence. It would have been simple for him to compromise, to be sidetracked, because if you read through the genealogies, Enoch, Methuselah and Lamech had many, many children. Noah was but one of them. So you could say that Noah obviously had an upbringing which feared the Lord, but so did his other siblings. But none of them here are mentioned as being favoured or gracious in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah lived in a time, in a world which was clearly corrupted, wicked, filled with violence. And I ask myself, and I ask you here, how simple is it sometimes to compromise, to be sidetracked, to find yourself fitting in with the crowd? You know, it may not be that we murder people or that we have other things which are <coughs> obviously very evil, but your honesty at work, your dealings at school, the sort of jokes you share... Do your friends know where you stand? Do your work colleagues know what you stand for? You know, I remember many times when I was, in fact, pretty much through most of my high school, nobody had any clue that I belonged to a church and that I went to church on Saturdays and Sundays and youth group on Thursdays because I didn't want, I didn't want to stand out from the crowd. I wanted to fit in and be accepted and to my shame, there's many that I knew in high school who I never met again after I left who would never have known that I was a believer. But Noah was blameless amongst the people of his time and that is why God considered him precious and favoured. Noah refused to be identified with the corruption around him he refused to compromise. He stood up to be counted alone. And he was alone. Alone in his family with his siblings, and he had many, and alone with those around him. Can you honestly and can I honestly answer with my own heart and say that I am blameless and that you are blameless amongst your peers, your teachers at school, your colleagues at work, amongst your family, and your spouse. Can God depend on you to stand up for him when it matters the most? When you're surrounded by lost souls, 
up to the necks in sin, ignorant of the promises of God, can God depend on you to stand up and say, hey guys, I know of a different way. I know of a judgment that's coming. And I know of someone who died on the cross for your sins. A lot of us here come from a Greek culture, and particularly in the previous generation. I remember my mum used to say this a lot, you know, where reputation is a very important thing. She would say to me, Ditha be or cosmos. What's everyone going to say if they found out that you did this? <coughs> and many of you who grew up with Greek parents may have also heard these words. Maybe we should be saying, Ditha be or theos. What will God say with your behaviour, with the way that you deal with those around you? What is your reputation before God? When the rest of the world becomes depraved, depraved and wicked, when biblical values get thrown out of the window, do we keep our integrity? Do we remain ambassadors for Christ? Are we a shining light to those around us? Are we blameless? Can people around me say that there is something definitely different about John. Can people around you say that there is something definitely different about you? Matthew Henry writes in his commentary, it is easy to be religious when religion is in fashion, but it shows strong faith and resolution to swim against the current and to appear for God when no one else will appear for him. Interestingly, that seems to be a very accurate description of the culture and thinking of our current age. It took, it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. God, in verse uh, 13, make yourself an ark and then after that, he speaks to him again in verse 7, chapter 1, where he says, come into the ark. So he speaks to Noah prior to the ark being commenced and built, gives him the dimensions, and then after the ark is built, in between these two, and after the ark is built, he speaks to him again then to enter into it. Now, in between these two passages lies 120 years of silence from God. 120 years. What motivated this man, Noah, to continue his work? I personally struggled to read the Bible every day for two weeks straight. <coughs> Yet, I have the Holy Spirit, I have God's Word my brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage me. I have this church. Yet Noah had none of these guys, none of these, uh, sorry, things. What makes Noah tick? What makes this guy be the man who he is? The answer is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith. That's it. By faith. Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. It was faith. Faith in what he had learned. <coughs> Excuse me. Faith in what he had learned from his great grandfather, his grandfather and his father, something which his siblings rejected, faith in the words of the Lord as they were revealed to him. And in fact, the definition of faith is given at the start of that Hebrews chapter in verse 1, which is, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of things we do not see. 
Noah had the faith to be sure that if he followed God's instructions, he and his family would be saved. And he was certain that the flood would come as God had warned him, even though we know that nobody had seen rain, as Philip explained a few weeks uh, last week, that no one had seen rain um, during that period because the way that the earth was um, water uh, was watered was through a mist or a moisture that rose up every morning from the ground, and he was certain that the flood would come. And verse, yeah, and verse 7 alludes to that, warned of things not yet seen. Noah's faith triumphed over all human reasoning. He built such a large vessel over 120 years. He gathered food for such a large number of creatures. He would have required to put in a great deal of care and labour and expense against this backdrop of 120 years and with that ridicule from his neighbours who would probably looked at him and thought, this guy, now where some of us are crazy, but this guy's absolutely lost the plot. But Noah, by faith, and that's what he was, persevered, his obedience was ready and he was absolute. Having begun to build, he did not cease until he had finished. And we must, we must also be the same. We must be certain by faith that our salvation only comes through the blood of the cross, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and we must be sure that he will one day return to claim his bride, that is his church. Are we preparing ourselves? Are we building that ark? Are we continuing that race? Or have we dropped off, become sidetracked? Are we even in the race? Are we waiting for Christ? My daughter Georgia is getting married next January uh, to a lovely young man, Stav, as you all know. And I see as Georgia and her mum work, I just give the credit card, but they're getting things arranged, the flowers, the dress, the invites, getting the cake sorted. Um, In fact, I've got one job to do. I've got to arrange the limos, and I haven't done that yet. But there is this anticipation for the wedding day. And the bride is getting ready. And if Stav looked at Georgia and saw that she wasn't interested, hadn't even looked at her dress yet, and hasn't really considered what the bridesmaids would wear, what the flowers going to be, he would think in his mind, is she really interested in getting married? Or is she being distracted by other things? <coughs> Are we waiting for Christ? How does Jesus Christ view our preparations? He would have seen Noah working away for 120 years to prepare this ark. What does Jesus Christ see when he views our life and our preparations? I've mentioned this before. When I was quite young, I had a um, children's Bible. It had really good pictures in it. I remember I used to sit down in front of the heater. We had one of those bar, those heaters which have got flame and got these bricks inside and they heat up. And I would sit in front of the heater uh, with a cup of Milo and I would just read, well, pretty much look at the pictures in this picture Bible. And Val tells me that she had a similar one as well, but hers was in Greek, so hers was extra special. Mine was in English. And I remember uh, there was the view, or well, there's the drawing of the flood um, as the rain was falling, and in this picture Bible, it was on a two-page spread, and the r- waters had risen quite high, and you could see in the distance the ark sort of floating, and there was a, in the foreground there was a, a cliff face and people clawing on the cliff. And there was a particular scene in that picture that haunted me. It was a, sight, it was a picture of a hand coming out of the water, just a hand, holding a baby up. 
in its last moments. And that's very powerful visual imagery. People, um, pictures of people are clawing over each other to get into the ark as the waters around them are rising, knocking possibly at the door. As I said, you know, people climbing on rocks, holding babies up as a last resort to save of a mother to save her child. And as I thought of this, and again, I've mentioned this in the past, who built the ark? Yes, Noah built the ark. God certainly didn't do it. He gave the instructions. Noah would have had a lot of help. There would have been carpenters, metal workers, farmers delivering supplies, 120 years of industry. There would have been people from other areas saying, excuse me, you know what, if you want to find work, there's this dude called Noah in the next town. He's building some big boat for no reason, but if you want to get work, go there. He'll pay you. <coughs> so what were their motives? Curiosity? Money? You know, they either they sell, they sell supplies or they get paid for labour to help with this ark. Maybe apprenticeships. You can learn carpentry in this job. Friendships, I'm sure there was a whole group of people helping, you could become friends, whatever they are. And I looked at that and I thought, those that were building the ark versus those who come to churches, maybe this church or other churches, what are your motives for attending church, for giving your time, for participating in various ministries. What are your motives? Because, as I've said in the past, participation does not equal salvation. There's many that would have participated in the building of this ark, but none of them got saved because they didn't really believe in what they were doing. They were there with the wrong motives. And I bring that to our time today. What is your motivation for attending church? Is it because you want to find someone nice to get married to? You want to have a safe and secure environment for your family? Is it because you like the friends, the good people? Or is it because you recognise that you're a sinner and that Jesus Christ offers the only hope and salvation? Or we can use that running the race analogy. <coughs> are you running the race? Are you a participant? Or are you a part of the support staff? Or are you a spectator? Noah, wait for us. I'm sure they would have called out. And in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, we read, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, were marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. There's a lot of interesting events happening around us today. I always look with very keen interest, as do most Christians and those interested in the end times, when things arise up in the Middle East. And we can see at the moment that the situation with Israel is very tense and there's a lot of commentary about it and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if this is part of the end times or, well I know it's part of the end times because it's prophesied but I don't know what will happen. But we do know that all these signs are an indication that the Lord is near. Now these people, these people back in the flood were forewarned yet they remained unprepared. 
And I can imagine them pounding on the door shouting, No, I open up. Remember me? I was the one who put all the hinges on the doors for you. I was the one that gave you a discount to help you cut down those gopher wood trees. Remember how I helped you cover the ark with pitch? How we sweated together? How I maybe lent you money at really good interest rates to help you cover the funds when you were running low? Keith Green in his song says, But Lord, there must be some mistake. How could you not know me? I gave money to your church. I gave money to purchase or maybe to renovate Pill Street. I was involved in the English service. I preached for you at the pulpit. I helped out in Sunday school, the youth group. I worked in the print shop. I gave out tracts every weekend. But the Lord replies, sorry, I never knew you. And that sinking feeling in your stomach of how foolish you were to reject the salvation of Christ. And imagine one day fronting up to the Lord and remembering yourself either sitting in this chair or listening online to the numerous sermons and putting aside the most important decision of your life. And God saying to you, sorry, I never knew you. And you've been coming here for all these years. As we conclude, are you a Christian? Are you a believer of God? Are you a child of God? <coughs> What's your reputation before man and more importantly, before God? The second point is faith is so important. That's what made Noah tick. Am I continuing in faith to run this race, to finish victorious, or am I at risk of falling by the wayside? And finally, motives. Why am I here? As I said, many were helping to build the ark, all for their own reasons, yet all were left outside but a very, very scant few, being Noah and his family. I pray that none of us who are gathered here or listening online will be left behind when our Lord returns again. May God bless his word in our hearts. Now let us pray. Let's all stand and let us pray and then we'll uh, close off with a hymn. Father, it is before your throne of grace <coughs> that we come to thank you for this time that we've shared together. We pray, Father, that what was um, spoken about with human weakness, may you, Father, cover it with your grace and your Holy Spirit and interpret it into our hearts. We thank you, Father, for your word and the examples that we had of men of faith like Noah in the Bible, Lord, and help us to aspire to be like them so that, Father, we may give glory to you through our reputation and the way that we interact and act with those around us, Father. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.